Chapter 70, The Reign of David. This chapter is based on 2 Samuel 5, 6-25, chapter 6, 7, 9, and 10. As soon as David was established on the throne of Israel, he began to seek a more appropriate location for the capital of his realm. Twenty miles from Hebron, a place was selected as a future metropolis of the kingdom. Before Joshua had led the armies of Israel over Jordan, it had been called Salem. Near this place, Abraham had proved his loyalty to God. Eight hundred years before the coronation of David, it had been the home of Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. It held a central and elevated position in the country and was protected by an environment of hills. Being on the border between Benjamin and Judah, it was in close proximity to Ephraim and was easy of access to the other tribes. In order to secure this location, the Hebrews must dispossess a remnant of the Canaanites who held a fortified position on the mountains of Zion and Moriah. This stronghold was called Jebus, and its inhabitants were known as Jebusites. For centuries, Jebus had been looked upon as impregnable, but it was besieged and taken by the Hebrews under the command of Joab, who, as the reward of his valor, was made commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel. Jebus now became the national capital, and its heathen name was changed to Jerusalem. Hiram, king of the wealthy city of Tyre on the Mediterranean Sea, now sought an alliance with the king of Israel and lent his aid to David in the work of erecting a palace at Jerusalem. Ambassadors were sent from Tyre, accompanied by architects and workmen, and long trains laden with costly wood, cedar trees, and other valuable material. The increasing strength of Israel in its union under David, the acquisition of the stronghold of Jebus, and the alliance with Hiram, king of Tyre, excited the hostility of the Philistines, and they again invaded the country with a strong force, taking up their position in the valley of Rephaim, but a short distance from Jerusalem. David, with his men of war, retired to the stronghold of Zion to await divine direction. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. David advanced upon the enemy at once, defeated and destroyed them, and took from them the gods which they had brought with them to ensure their victory. Exasperated by the humiliation of their defeat, the Philistines gathered a still larger force and returned to the conflict. And again they spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Again David sought the Lord, and the great I Am took the direction of the armies of Israel. God instructed David, saying, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. If David, like Saul, had chosen his own way, success would not have attended him. But he did as the Lord had commanded, and he smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. First Chronicles chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Now that David was firmly established upon the throne and free from the invasions of foreign foes, he turned to the accomplishment of a cherished purpose, to bring up the ark of God to Jerusalem. For many years the ark had remained at kirjath Jerem, nine miles distant, but it was fitting that the capital of the nation should be honored with the token of the divine presence. David summoned 30,000 of the leading men of Israel, for it was his purpose to make the occasion a scene of great rejoicing and imposing display. The people responded gladly to the call. The high priest, with his brethren in sacred office, and the princes and leading men of the tribes, assembled at kirjath Jerem. David was aglow with holy zeal. The ark was brought out from the house of Abinadab and placed upon a new cart drawn by oxen, 
while two of the sons of Abinadab attended it. The men of Israel followed with exultant shouts and songs of rejoicing, a multitude of voices joining in melody with the sound of musical instruments. David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord, on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. It had been long since Israel had witnessed such a scene of triumph. With solemn gladness, the vast procession wound its way along the hills and valleys toward the holy city. But when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his rashness. And there he died by the ark of God. A sudden terror fell upon the rejoicing throng. David was astonished and greatly alarmed, and in his heart he questioned the justice of God. He had been seeking to honor the ark as the symbol of the divine presence. Why then had that fearful judgment been sent to turn the season of gladness into an occasion of grief and mourning? Feeling that it would be unsafe to have the ark near him, David determined to let it remain where it was. A place was found for it nearby at the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The fate of Yuza was a divine judgment upon the violation of a most explicit command. Through Moses, the Lord had given special instruction concerning the transportation of the ark. None but the priests, the descendants of Aaron, were to touch it, or even to look upon it uncovered. The divine direction was, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. The priests were to cover the ark, and then the Kohathites must lift it by the staves, which were placed in rings upon each side of the ark, and were never removed. To the Gershonites and the Merorites, who had in charge the curtains and boards and pillars of the tabernacle, Moses gave carts and oxen for the transportation of that which was committed to them. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. Numbers chapter 7, verse 9. Thus in the bringing of the ark from kirjath Jerim, there had been a direct and inexcusable disregard of the Lord's directions. David and his people had assembled to perform a sacred work, and they had engaged in it with glad and willing hearts. But the Lord could not accept the service because it was not performed in accordance with His directions. The Philistines, who had not a knowledge of God's law, had placed the ark upon a cart when they had returned it to Israel, and the Lord accepted the effort which they made. But the Israelites had in their hands a plain statement of the will of God in all these matters, and their neglect of these instructions was dishonoring to God. Upon Uzzah rested the greater guilt of presumption. Transgression of God's law had lessened his sense of its sacredness, and with unconfessed sins upon him, he had, in face of the divine prohibition, presumed to touch the symbol of God's presence. God can accept no partial obedience, no lax way of treating His commandments. By the judgment upon Uzzah, he designed to impress upon all Israel the importance of giving strict heed to his requirements. Thus the death of that one man, by leading the people to repentance, might prevent the necessity of inflicting judgments upon thousands. Feeling that his own heart was not wholly right with God, David, seeing the stroke upon Uzzah, had feared the ark, lest some sin on his part should bring judgments upon him. But Obed-Edom, though he rejoiced with trembling, welcomed the sacred symbol as the pledge of God's favor to the obedient. The attention of all Israel was now directed to the Gittite and his household. All watched to see how it would fare with them. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Upon David the divine rebuke accomplished its work. He was led to realize, as he had never realized before, the sacredness of the law of God and the necessity of strict obedience. The favor shown to the house of Obed-Edom led David again to hope that the ark might bring a blessing to him and to his people.
At the end of three months, he resolved to make another attempt to remove the ark, and he now gave earnest heed to carry out in every particular the directions of the Lord. Again the chief men of the nation were summoned, and a vast assemblage gathered about the dwelling place of the Gittite. With reverent care, the ark was now placed upon the shoulders of men of divine appointment. The multitude fell into line, and with trembling hearts the vast procession again set forth. After advancing six paces, the trumpet sounded a halt. By David's direction, sacrifices of oxen and fatlings were to be offered. Rejoicing now took the place of trembling and terror. The king had laid aside his royal robes and had attired himself in a plain linen ephod, such as was worn by the priests. He did not by this act signify that he assumed priestly functions, for the ephod was sometimes worn by others besides the priests. But in this holy service he would take his place, as before God, on an equality with his subjects. Upon that day Jehovah was to be adored. He was to be the sole object of reverence. Again the long train was in motion, and the music of harp and cornet, trumpet and cymbal floated heavenward, blended with the melody of many voices. And David danced before the Lord in his gladness, keeping time to the measure of the song. David's dancing in reverent joy before God has been cited by pleasure lovers in justification of the fashionable modern dance. But there's no ground for such an argument. In our day, dancing is associated with folly and midnight reveling. Health and morals are sacrificed to pleasure. By the frequenters of the ballroom, God is not an object of thought and reverence. Prayer or the song of praise would be felt to be out of place in their assemblies. This test should be decisive. Amusements that have a tendency to weaken the love for sacred things and lessen our joy in the service of God are not to be sought by Christians. The music and dancing in joyful praise to God at the removal of the ark had not the faintest resemblance to the dissipation of modern dancing. The one tended to the remembrance of God and exalted His holy name. The other is a device of Satan to cause men to forget God and to dishonor Him. The triumphal procession approached the capital, following the sacred symbol of their invisible king. Then a burst of song demanded of the watchers upon the walls that the gates of the holy city should be thrown open. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. A band of singers and players answered, Who is this King of glory? From another company came the response, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Then hundreds of voices uniting swelled the triumphal chorus, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Again the joyful interrogation was heard, Who is this King of glory? And the voice of the great multitude, like the sound of many waters, was heard in the rapturous reply, The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10. Then the gates were opened wide, the procession entered, and with reverent awe the ark was deposited in the tent that had been prepared for its reception. Before the sacred enclosure, altars for sacrifice were erected. The smoke of peace offerings and burnt offerings, and the clouds of incense, with the praises and supplications of Israel, ascended to heaven. The service ended, the king himself pronounced a benediction upon his people. Then with regal bounty he caused gifts of food and wine to be distributed for their refreshment. All the tribes had been represented in this service, the celebration of the most sacred event that had yet marked the reign of David. The spirit of divine inspiration had rested upon the king, and now, as the last beams of the setting sun bathed the tabernacle in a hallowed light, his heart was uplifted in gratitude to God that the blessed symbol of his presence was now so near the throne of Israel. Thus musing, David turned toward his palace to bless his household. But there was one who had witnessed the scene of rejoicing with a spirit widely different from that which moved the heart of David. 
as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. In the bitterness of her passion she could not await David's return to the palace, but went out to meet him, and to his kindly greeting poured forth a torrent of bitter words. Keen and cutting was the irony of her speech. How glorious was the King of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. David felt that it was the service of God which Michael had despised and dishonored, and he sternly answered, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father, and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. To David's rebuke was added that of the Lord. Because of her pride and arrogance, Michael had no child unto the day of her death. The solemn ceremonies attending the removal of the ark had made a lasting impression upon the people of Israel, arousing a deeper interest in the sanctuary service and kindling anew their zeal for Jehovah. David endeavored by every means in his power to deepen these impressions. The service of song was made a regular part of religious worship, and David composed psalms not only for the use of the priests in the sanctuary service, but also to be sung by the people in their journeys to the national altar at the annual feasts. The influence thus exerted was far-reaching, and it resulted in freeing the nation from idolatry. Many of the surrounding peoples, beholding the prosperity of Israel, were led to think favorably of Israel's God, who had done such great things for His people. The tabernacle built by Moses, with all that appertained to the sanctuary service, except the ark, was still at Gibeah. It was David's purpose to make Jerusalem the religious center of the nation. He had erected a palace for himself, and he felt that it was not fitting for the ark of God to rest within a tent. He determined to build for it a temple of such magnificence as should express Israel's appreciation of the honor granted the nation in the abiding presence of Jehovah their king. Communicating his purpose to the prophet Nathan, he received the encouraging response, Do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, giving him a message for the king. David was to be deprived of the privilege of building a house for God, but he was granted an assurance of the divine favor to him, to his posterity, and to the kingdom of Israel. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcoat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. As David had desired to build a house for God, the promise was given, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. I will set up thy seed after thee. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The reason why David was not to build the temple was declared, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest and I will give him rest from all his enemies. His name shall be Solomon, peaceable, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. First Chronicles chapter 22, verses 8 to 10. Though the cherished purpose of his heart had been denied, David received the message with gratitude. Who am I, O Lord God? he exclaimed, 
And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And he then renewed his covenant with God. David knew that it would be an honor to his name and would bring glory to his government to perform the work that he had purposed in his heart to do, but he was ready to submit his will to the will of God. The grateful resignation thus manifested is rarely seen even among Christians. How often do those who have passed the strength of manhood cling to the hope of accomplishing some great work upon which their hearts are set, but which they are unfitted to perform? God's providence may speak to them, as did his prophet to David, declaring that the work which they so much desire is not committed to them. It is theirs to prepare the way for another to accomplish it. But instead of gratefully submitting to the divine direction, many fall back as if slighted and rejected, feeling that if they cannot do the one thing which they desire to do, they will do nothing. Many cling with desperate energy to responsibilities which they are incapable of bearing, and vainly endeavor to accomplish a work for which they are insufficient, while that which they might do lies neglected. And because of this lack of cooperation on their part, the greater work is hindered or frustrated. David in his covenant with Jonathan had promised that when he should have rest from his enemies, he would show kindness to the house of Saul. In his prosperity, mindful of this covenant, the king made inquiry, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? He was told of a son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, who had been lame from childhood. At the time of Saul's defeat by the Philistines at Jezreel, the nurse of this child, attempting to flee with him, had let him fall, thus making him a lifelong cripple. David now summoned the young man to court and received him with great kindness. The private possessions of Saul were restored to him for the support of his household, but the son of Jonathan was himself to be the constant guest of the king, sitting daily at the royal table. Through reports from the enemies of David, Mephibosheth had been led to cherish a strong prejudice against him as a usurper, but the monarch's generous and courteous reception of him and his continued kindness won the heart of the young man. He became strongly attached to David, and like his father Jonathan, he felt that his interest was one with that of the king whom God had chosen. After David's establishment upon the throne of Israel, the nation enjoyed a long interval of peace. The surrounding peoples, seeing the strength and unity of the kingdom, soon thought it prudent to desist from open hostilities. And David, occupied with the organization and upbuilding of his kingdom, refrained from aggressive war. At last, however, he made war upon Israel's old enemies, the Philistines, and upon the Moabites, and succeeded in overcoming both and making them tributary. Then there was formed against the kingdom of David a vast coalition of the surrounding nations, out of which grew the greatest wars and victories of his reign, and the most extensive accessions to his power. This hostile alliance, which really sprang from jealousy of David's increasing power, had been wholly unprovoked by him. The circumstances that led to its rise were these. Tidings were received at Jerusalem announcing the death of Nahash, king of the Ammonites, a monarch who had shown kindness to David when he was a fugitive from the rage of Saul. Now, Desiring to express his grateful appreciation of the favor shown him in his distress, David sent ambassadors with a message of sympathy to Hanan, the son and successor of the Ammonite king. Said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. But his courteous act was misinterpreted. The Ammonites hated the true God and were the bitter enemies of Israel. The apparent kindness of Nahash to David had been prompted wholly by hostility to Saul as king of Israel. The message of David was misconstrued by Hanan's counselors. They said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he has sent comforters unto thee? 
Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city, and to spy it out, and to overthrow it? It was by the advice of his counselors that Nahash, half a century before, had been led to make the cruel condition required of the people of Jabesh Gilead, when, besieged by the Ammonites, they sued for a covenant of peace. Nahash had demanded the privilege of thrusting out all their right eyes. The Ammonites still vividly remembered how the king of Israel had foiled their cruel design and had rescued the people whom they would have humbled and mutilated. The same hatred of Israel still prompted them. They could have no conception of the generous spirit that had inspired David's message. When Satan controls the minds of men, he will excite envy and suspicion, which will misconstrue the very best intentions. Listening to his counselors, Hanan regarded David's messengers as spies and loaded them with scorn and insult. The Ammonites had been permitted to carry out the evil purposes of their hearts without restraint, that their real character might be revealed to David. It was not God's will that Israel should enter into a league with this treacherous heathen people. In ancient times, as now, the office of ambassador was held sacred. By the universal law of nations, it ensured protection from personal violence or insult. The ambassador, standing as a representative of his sovereign, any indignity offered to him demanded prompt retaliation. The Ammonites, knowing that the insult offered to Israel would surely be avenged, made preparation for war. When the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanan and the children of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire them chariots and horsemen out of Mesopotamia, and out of Syria Machka, and out of Zobah. So they hired thirty and two thousand chariots, and the children of Ammon gathered themselves together from their cities and came to battle. 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. It was indeed a formidable alliance. The inhabitants of the region lying between the river Euphrates and the Mediterranean Sea had leagued with the Ammonites. The north and east of Canaan was encircled with armed foes, banded together to crush the kingdom of Israel. The Hebrews did not wait for the invasion of their country. Their forces under Joab crossed the Jordan and advanced toward the Ammonite capital. As the Hebrew captain led his army to the field, he sought to inspire them for the conflict, saying, Be of good courage, and let us behave ourselves valiantly for our people and for the cities of our God, and let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 13. The united forces of the Allies were overcome in the first engagement. But they were not yet willing to give over the contest, and the next year renewed the war. The king of Syria gathered his forces, threatening Israel with an immense army. David, realizing how much depended upon the result of this contest, took the field in person, and by the blessing of God inflicted upon the Allies a defeat so disastrous that the Syrians, from Lebanon to the Euphrates, not only gave up the war, but became tributary to Israel. Against the Ammonites, David pushed the war with vigor until their strongholds fell, and the whole region came under the dominion of Israel. The dangers which had threatened the nation with utter destruction proved through the providence of God to be the very means by which it rose to unprecedented greatness. In commemorating his remarkable deliverances, David sings, the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Even the God that executeth vengeance for me, and subdueth peoples under me, he rescueth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above them that rise up against me. Thou deliverest me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the nations, and will sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth loving kindness to his anointed, to David and to his seed forever. Psalm 18, verses 46 to 50, the Revised Version. And throughout the songs of David, the thought was impressed on his people that Jehovah was their strength and deliverer. There is no king saved by the multitude of a host, 
A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Psalm 33, verses 16 and 17. Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies, and hast put them to shame that hated us. Psalm 44, verses 4 to 7. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of Jehovah our God. Psalm 20, verse 7. The kingdom of Israel had now reached in extent the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham, and afterward repeated to Moses, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. Israel had become a mighty nation, respected and feared by surrounding peoples. In his own realm, David's power had become very great. He commanded, as few sovereigns in any age have been able to command, the affections and allegiance of his people. He had honored God, and God was now honoring him. But in the midst of prosperity lurked danger. In the time of his greatest outward triumph, David was in the greatest peril and met his most humiliating defeat. 